Welcome back, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to the brand new episode of Film Strippers after about a year and a half. Uh, we're going to start doing this weird little intro thingy because it seems like a lot of podcasts are doing that. And there's a couple of notes that I wanted to make before our episode starts. Um, today, we are, Kelsey and I, talking about uh, pandemic films uh, during our quarantine here at home. Kelsey is in Chicago, and, and I am here in Harrisonburg, Virginia. And today, we're talking about Contagion, 28 Days Later, 10 Cloverfield Lane, and Children of Men. Um, there's a bit where we get into talking about the directors of such. Of course, the Children of Men director is Alfonso Cuaron, and uh, he also directed Gravity and Roma. And we mixed up uh, somehow him with Alejandro, who directed Birdman and The Revenant. Um, and so that I wanted to bring attention to that little mix up here, so you know the real facts after we realized our mistake. Uh, Uh, and coming back and I don't want to edit anything in the podcast I want to give it to our listeners as beautiful and raw as possible but thank you again for listening to film strippers after all of this time uh, if you like the episode leave a review feel free to share it with our friends we're going to launch a YouTube channel if you're watching this on YouTube thanks for uh, joining us hit the like and subscribe as they like to say and uh, we look forward to more film strippers there's already some more talks uh in in the books of people that we're gonna interview possibly and some other stuff so uh we're back baby virus is 15 to 19 kilobases in length and containing six to ten genes typical of a paramyx of virus a potentially King a Kong mutant on and frankenstein of, 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 all in hold one on. I'll, I'll call you back. And you've got it in there, haven't you? Oh, really? Look, Where'd get away from? from here, Alan. Military, you're not a doctor and you're not a writer. Organism. Yes, I am a writer. Yes, I am. Blogging is not writing. <laughs> it's graffiti with punctuation. Welcome back, film strippers. For the first time in over a year, it's we are back. It's almost been two years at this point. No, it... Well, a year and a half. Maybe. December. Yeah, a year and a half about... That's crazy. Since we last recorded and released an episode of Film Strippers. And why are we back, Kelsey? We are back because, well, we really don't have anything better to do right now, right? (laughs) We are quarantined. Except for watch movies. And so we decided that we would think it would be fun to do a special uh, podcast episode today on pandemic movies. A pandemic revival. A pandemic revival. In, of film strippers. Yeah, so here we are. Uh, so yeah, we're going to talk about four movies that Kelsey and I decided to watch during the quarantine and record a new episode on to hit the waves again and hopefully revive film strippers to be more than just a one back episode because we also talked about coming back in the future and watching all of the 007 films. Mm-hmm. From beginning to end, and then watching No Time to Die together and recording a new episode Mm -hmm. about specifically No Time to Die, but also touching on the entire Bond franchise, which I've been in the middle of doing. I just watched uh, You Only Live Twice yesterday, and so I'm still really hyped on this, even though Bond is delayed until November. Because of COVID-19. Because of COVID. We were going to do a Bond episode, (laughs) relevant, but instead, here we are. So here we are. And so we chose four movies. So today we are going to talk about uh, Contagion, 28 Days Later, 10 Cloverfield Lane and Children of Men. And we're going to give like a a little bit of an intro thing. Um, We're going to talk about the virus, COVID-19 and all that jazz and maybe a general overview of these movies and why we selected them. And then we're going to get into the details and then we'll give spoiler warnings before we talk about each film. But uh, once we get into the details, there will be some spoilers. But we'll uh, we'll give you a big heads up if you don't want, you know, Contagion or 20 Days Later or whatever spoiler for you highly recommend going and watching all four of these movies Mm -hmm. during your quarantine uh before you check out the entire episode we don't want to spoil anything yeah they're all pretty good movies and i i think i enjoyed all of them um, but we'll get into that more later um so why did we pick these movies so i i don't remember what our conversation was like exactly um but i i know I kind of wanted a really good excuse to watch 28 Days Later again and 10 Cloverfield Lane again. Those were 
two huge picks that I was gunning for. Mm -hmm. um, and also I had never seen Contagion. Yeah. And then you were like, hey, why don't we also do Children of Men? And I had never seen that. And so I was like, oh, hell yeah, that's mm -hmm. a great idea. Um, so our, our idea here was to kind of go through uh, and find these movies that have a lot to do with the different waves of a pandemic. And so we have Contagion, which is, you know, the hit of an actual pandemic and, and feels honestly closest to home out of all a of these. A little too close um, to home. <laughs> I know, it's crazy. And uh, which is interesting because Contagion, which uh, came out in 2011, did well enough to you know get its budget back at the box office but also didn't really hit home too much even after h1n1 but as soon as covid19 hit it skyrocketed to the top yeah. of the itunes rental charts <laughs> everyone was like oh now i can watch this movie and it's relevant and you know it really which is. is really just odd because i don't i don't know it it's a it's a I don't know why you would necessarily want to watch this particular movie during the middle of a pandemic. It was weird. Cause it was really weird. It's like watching what's happening outside. So it was... But I mean, that's why like it's guess, actually yeah. relevant, you know? So it's like... But then again, if we're caught in the middle of a zombie apocalypse, I probably won't I don't want to watch like later. 28 Days Later or Shaun of the Dead. No. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's my but, point. Uh, so we also chose to watch 28 Days Later, mm -hmm. which we chose because it is in the middle of an apocalypse. And even though it's, it's, it is technically a disease. That's what's beautiful about 28 Days Later is mm -hmm. it's technically a disease. Well, yeah, it was, it was um, actually modeled after Ebola. So yeah, they, they yeah. did that on purpose. Yeah, and so that's really cool, but it is, you know, a zombie film. So, but even though it's not directly what we're experiencing right now, it really, I think it fits in mm -hmm. with the whole, like, this is what an apocalypse is like, kickstarted from a disease. Um, and then uh, 10 Cloverfield Lane, we picked because it's a really good quarantine movie. Um, uh, you're stuck inside something, some apocalyptic, crazy pandemic, whatever is happening outside, you're stuck inside. And it's a really good expose on the horror of who you might be stuck with um and then finally we chose children of men uh which kelsey you highlighted to me was the perfect post-apocalyptic movie and after mm -hmm. watching it i fully agree probably the best produced and executed post-apocalyptic film i have ever yeah, seen because it's i chose that one because it was post-apocalyptic but not in a mad max way more of a, like an mm -hmm. actual realistic way of like how a society yeah. could potentially move forward from some kind of like illness or virus, which I thought it did a good job of, but we'll get into that later. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I think what's beautiful about all four of these movies, and really, I mean, this is one of the biggest things that highlight or separate good movies from mediocre movies for me, is all four of these movies really touch on the humanity and human aspect of what's going on mm -hmm. there there are these you know there's of course this virus this evil this plot uh that drives the story but what we ultimately care about is humanity and how humanity deals with what is happening mm -hmm. and that's what all four of these movies have in common yeah exactly and i think that was we'll we'll get into i wanted to bring that up during 28 days later but i think that that was what set mm -hmm. that movie apart from other zombie movies is its focus on its characters and yes. humanity Yes, yes, yes. Um, and so, yeah, uh, also, we are recording the video of this in a Zoom meeting. We're going to try to put this up on YouTube. If you're watching this from YouTube already, thank you for watching on YouTube. If you subscribe and we get a lot of viewers and we get a lot of likes, then we'll go back through our archives and put all our old episodes up and we'll continue to record these videos while we do new episodes, which I think would be really fun. Yeah. So, yeah. Um before we get into the virus and talking about contagion, uh, what was your favorite out of these four movies? What was your least favorite and why? No spoilers. Uh, Children of Men, because I think it favorite? is. Yeah, I think it's the best movie, like technically speaking, of all of mm -hmm. them. I think it's an incredible film. Uh, and my least favorite was Ten Cloverfield, and I think that's mostly because of the ending and the fact that I had not seen the first Cloverfield. So you didn't need to though. Uh, yeah, but the ending, the ending kind of threw it, me for a little bit of a JJ Abrams has described Ten Cloverfield Lane and Cloverfield as blood brothers, but they're not. They happen in the same universe, but they're not. You know, you don't have to see one 
and you, you don't need to see one to see the other. They're completely separate. They they stated that in the future, even though we also have Cloverfield Paradox now, which was terrible, uh, in the future, they're going to tie all of them together, which they've done little bits and pieces, but really the only thing that Cloverfield has to do with 10 Cloverfield Lane, and this is not spoilers for either one, is they have the same... Um, product placement like fake products in that happen in the universe um i can't remember the name there's a drink like it's not sploosh but for whatever reason sploosh is coming to my mind but it's some like fake drink thing that's an ad and then sploosh. some like <laughs> sploosh the beverage uh-huh. some like um uh technological organization or something is a recurring theme but like location is completely different everything is completely different um, but like isn't as far the, as the movies go cause i don't want to get into spoilers yet but isn't the cause i mean we know same? everyone knows that cloverfield is about a sort of alien monster thing that destroys new york city that's what cloverfield you see, is about you say everyone knows that but see when i was watching this movie i literally had no idea what cloverfield <laughs> you had no idea what i never saw was? it i didn't know anything about it except i that mean it, the previews and everything like it's it came like cloverfield it's it's came out when i was like in middle school i want to say like i don't know if i even saw pre- so you've had plenty of time to watch it i don't, I don't just care. the preview i just knew that it was like the handheld <laughs> camera and i was like oh i don't think i'm gonna like that so i'm not gonna watch it so i yeah. didn't know anything Cloverfield doesn't hold a match to 10 Cloverfield Lane. Cloverfield Lane is a whole different ballgame. It's so good. Well, I have some thoughts that might be controversial for 10 Cloverfield. Okay, I did, we'll wait till we to get to fair, that. To be fair, I liked the movie, but we'll, we'll, we'll discuss this later. Well, so uh, I'll try to keep mine, mine short, but mine, um, 28 Days Later, mm-hmm. top of the list for me. Uh, Cloverfield Lane is a very close second. Bottom of the list is Contagion. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, w- I think I would give the same. Well, no, I, d- I have a completely different ranking, actually. Because <laughs> um, I would. <laughs> I think I'd give the same, just completely different. Yeah, just, it's completely. Re- oh, yeah. So I would do 28 Days Later, then Contagion, then 10 Cloverfield. But Children of Men is the top, top tier. That's fair. All right. Well, let's get into it. So we're going to, we're going to talk about the virus Mm -hmm. um kelsey give us some some facts about covid19 i know you're you've been the one that's you you'll hit me up and be like hey what have you been up to i'm like oh you know our previous roommate Cade. he's coming over to hang out we're gonna you know just chill on the couch and watch a movie and you're the one to give me endless amounts of shit about seeing one other person during this quarantine which fair enough you know he did come and hang out for a couple days i'm making a point not to go out I'm getting my groceries taken to my car. I order them well, on the good. app. I'm trying Are not to, to, to interact with anybody. Oh, I've washed my hands more in the past month than I ever have my entire well, that's life. that's really I alarming. live with a bottle of hand sanitizer. I don't know how like, I feel it's... about this, but uh, I feel like you should have been washing <laughs> your hands the whole time you've been alive. But, you know, well, progress is progress. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, But tell, tell us, like, uh, I mean, how serious. It, it's obviously mm-hmm. pretty serious if it's, you know we are in a quarantine mm-hmm. in the middle of a pandemic, but like, you know, give me some stuff. I don't yeah. know. About. Well, first I think we should just put this out there. Neither of us are medical experts whatsoever. Right. Good call. Good call. So <laughs> I honestly, like you people who are listening to this, you probably know most of what we're going to be saying if you've been following this, but, and this is also important to note that this was recorded on April 11th. And since this is a evolving situation, Everything that we could be saying might be false tomorrow. Who knows, right? This is true. Um, it's all fake news. So I asked my sister a couple of questions because she is an epidemiologist, which we will be getting into a little bit in Contagion. Uh, cause there is- what the hell is that even? Yeah, so an epidemiologist is somebody who... I hope Kristen's not listening to this part. Uh, Are you going to get it wrong? <laughs> no, this is just like the very basic, <laughs> my understanding of what she does is she is basically tracking the disease so that we can better predict it. That's the easiest way I think to explain it. So like one of her jobs is she has to go track every person who is a confirmed case in her county and then see where their contact points are. So, like, where they've been, who they've hung out with, how is this disease, like, traveling, right? Because when we have that data, then we can, you know, easily track it better and know what the best way to combat it is. 
yeah, yeah. So that's pretty much makes yeah. sense so like uh, i i've been curious about people in her position those sorts of mm-hmm. jobs is that one of those positions that like most of the year they're like my job is pretty chill for the most part and then like something <laughs> like this happens and they're like you know fire no, under their uh, ass they have to work all day every day no and, like, so you know. uh today was Kristen's my um that's my sister her first day off in 41 days yeah. holy shit yeah so um uh, it's been a very difficult for her i believe what she does regularly is just track like normal that was in quotation marks normal diseases you know like the flu mm-hmm. things like that so she's still busy she's still doing stuff right, right? um but it's just on complete steroids kind of like how hospitals are running at maximum capacity now like doctors yeah. have always been busy but now we are hitting the like the point where we can't help everybody who is sick yeah so that's the problem yeah yeah it's not good mm. and that's what the whole idea of flattening the curve is right i'm sure you've heard that yeah, yeah so flattening the curve is just flattening the curve so that we can get it under the level that um hospitals can actually take care of everybody who is sick so how how important is it like it, it, the fact that like I'm not supposed to go hang out with my family. Like the 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 order mm-hmm. in Virginia. You're in, you're in Chicago. Mm-hmm. I'm in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. And statewide, our order like legally, like we can't have gatherings of ten or more. Mm-mm. Under that not anymore, it's even more strict now. Oh really? <laughs> yeah, I think you're allowed to like meet with one other person outside of your household. Maybe. Well, so when when the official orders were given out, unless it's changed in like the past, I think like what six or seven days, yeah. um, when the official order was given out, legally, like you could get fined mm-hmm. and face jail time if you met with ten or more people, um, or if you're everything else going outside to do anything that's non-essential. Well, that was what was recommended. That wasn't like oh, it- they're not gonna. They're, that wasn't part of like the law. But they were like, we recommend that in six feet apart, anything non-essential, you can't go outside unless you're just exercising, mm-hmm. like stuff like that. But that was just you know like mm-hmm. recommended, which is why I think a lot of people no, were it's like, definitely the law. Oh, we can now. do whatever. It's definitely an executive order, which is the same as a law so right uh, yeah. you're wrong yeah. it has been that way for a while I in mean, virginia it's... and you guys are actually yeah. uh, have the longest lockdown in the country right now the longest lockdown do you know how long you're supposed to be doing this for nope i mean i, I the the <laughs> orders were like what it was end of june or in less amended june 10th yeah i'm only under lockdown but it's gonna be amended before then like it's not gonna last till june 10th there's no way they they that set that date where, with like no that's actually of, like, where you're that wrong is, there's no, no way. you're actually that's not true you're wrong it is very likely that this will be continuing well into may very potentially even into the middle of the june like a lockdown status yeah this is like it's not getting better at all that's crazy. Why is it not getting because better? Because people aren't following a lot of the rules that are in place. And especially when you have a country that's as big as ours and each state has different ways of handling this. Uh, some states aren't even doing quarantines or um, shelter in places at all. And yes. then they go to, I yeah. mean, so they, then they travel and then they get everybody else sick. That's how it works. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that's not good. No, it's not good. Because um, it's, it's already changed a lot. Like, it was supposed to be two weeks for Illinois, and now we're sheltering in place until April 30th. And I'm sure that'll get extended. Yeah, April 30th. Yeah. That's fine. We're going to be done by April 30th. See, that? See, this is why we said we are not <laughs> medical experts. <laughs> this is, I this am is a medical expert. Right now. You're like that one guy. I have guy. a degree in sitting on my couch and watching movies. Yes, there we go. That's, that is accurate. That is real information. I do have a film degree, so, you know. Hmm. Oh, great. Well, that's useful right now. <laughs> so I have a degree. <laughs> um, but it is, it is really serious, basically long story short it is serious and there are really easy ways to prevent the spread of this disease because fortunately it's not as deadly as the disease and contagion <laughs> yeah. right but it is it is pretty deadly um i mean it's not something to joke around about um so yeah we should be taking it seriously but anyway what i was saying is it's really easy to slow the spread by doing things that are super simple like staying inside right 
That requires literally zero effort because you're not doing anything, right? Or washing your hands for 20 seconds. Like those are those are the easiest things you can do to help stop the spread of this disease. Yeah. So I, I don't want to get too deep into this because this is not a political podcast or, or anything like that. Oh, and great. I also want to get to talking about movies. But I do want to say like uh, what there's got to be a balance mm-hmm. between safety and economic impact. Mm. That's interesting. You know, you like where that is that up? balance? Because um, my governor, what and J, J.B. Pritzker, when he issued the shelter in um, place order, he said, he, he understood he was picking between people's livelihoods and their lives, right? Mm-hmm. But you can't have a livelihood without a life, mm-hmm. right? So that's really, that's the question is how do you balance that? But I mean, I, I'm personally under the impression that I think it's important to save lives over the economy because the economy can come back, right? It yeah. always has, but we can't get those people back. Right. And it, and even if you want to look at it from a, a different way, if we have a massive loss of population, that will also hurt the economy significantly. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, either way you look at it, this sucks, but this is kind of what has to be done. Yeah. Yeah, because I live above a bar and restaurant, which is one of my favorite places in town, mm-hmm. and it's closed down indefinitely. Um, our old roommate lost his job. Mm-hmm. He was working at a fancy restaurant as a chef and they completely closed down um they're gone uh my brother just lost his job um he was working in marketing for a company in in richmond yeah my Um, boyfriend was laid off too and see that's what we're seeing is it's not just this economy issue isn't just affecting like restaurants workers or bar workers stuff like that it's starting to hit all of the aspects of every industry you could think of because yeah everything is shut down we can't do anything but I mean, yeah. the faster people start following those rules, the faster this is over, right? Mm-hmm. That's why it's important. Because this sucks, and I want to go outside and do stuff. But you know, I'm I'm trying to be a good citizen and just stay inside my house and watch movies and record podcasts. So, <laughs> and here we, and here are. we are. So let, let's get to it. We're gonna hit a spoiler alert button right mm-hmm. now. Uh, because we've talked about what we're up to, we've talked about the virus, uh, we've given a general overview. Now we're going to get into the movies, and specifically mm-hmm. we'll start with Contagion. Um, and I think so with Contagion, say, we should probably put a spoiler alert for 28 Days Later. I do feel like we're going to be talking about those a lot mm-hmm. together, specifically. All right, so you got it now. Spoiler stamp alert on Contagion and 20 Days Later specifically. Um, After that, we are going to jump into 10 Cloverfield Lane and then Children of Men, and we'll hit spoiler alerts there too. But if you're kind of jumping through to try to skip this section to get to the next one, um, be careful because we are going to jump into spoilers for the other films We are going to try our best to stick to the films and not spoil yeah, we're not yeah. going to go through like the whole plot and stuff like that. We don't have but we're time also not we going to specifically beat around we the bush. Talk about four films. We gotta that and like that's the problem <laughs> that I have with other film review podcasts. I understand that we are one in hundreds and hundreds of film review podcasts, and we're nothing original. Mm-hmm. We just try to put our own spin on things, um, and and I can't stand podcasts that are like here's the entire plot from beginning to end of Contagion. Like, if you're listening to this, you've seen the fucking movie. Yeah. You don't need me to tell you what happens, goddammit. Exactly. It. So, yeah. Just go watch sorry. the movie if you have an hour and a half to, like, do something. <laughs> don't let me tell you what happens. Watch the fucking movie. All right, All right. so what happens All in right. Contagion? <laughs> well, it starts out yeah. uh, with a bat and a pig. No, that's how it ends. <laughs> spoilers spoilers, we yeah. spoilers. Well, yeah we're good um, um so contagion uh had you seen this movie before no me either the, so we like i think we said this already but we picked this movie because it was trending on everything every social media platform i kept seeing contagion contagion yeah. contagion and i was like well i guess i gotta watch this movie and while i was watching it i was like so surprised by how eerily accurate it is to what's going on right now yeah, and because it was 2011, yeah. I figured that it was like it was probably something 
obviously it was relevant because it's this pandemic and sort of a horror pandemic movie but i agree with you i i saw things mm-hmm. like clearly this rode off the coattails of h1n1 mm-hmm. but then it was like here's what h1n1 plus some really intense shit would be like and covid19 is clearly like a step above mm-hmm. h1n1 and is sort of a, a bridge between uh, H1N1 and then the uh, the virus and contagion. Hope, I can't remember hopefully, what it's called. Because um, so far, as of, again, today, April 11th, so far we have had, I wrote this down, around 100,000 deaths, right? And in can Really? Yeah. Oh, Holy shit. So that's global. Global. That's yeah. important to note. Um, globally. Which, I yeah. mean, can we really trust, like all of our sources and that's and it's not just about trusting like sources that. it's about we don't have testing we can't test every single person who has COVID 19 right so right. these numbers are just confirmed and obviously this okay. number is significantly higher right yeah, it, yeah. especially about uh, they they think around a quarter of people who have this virus don't have symptoms so there's that that's Interesting. great too right um and in contagion i think the end number was about two and a half million people died worldwide good god so i know it's it's not that far off which is kind of scary yeah yeah well so uh what is interesting is like what's easy to imagine is if covid19 had a higher death Mm -hmm. rate I can easily see the world slipping into a crazy, like, we're gonna have these factions of people that loot and kill each other and, like, all of this crazy shit. Like, if it was more deadly, I could actually see the public reacting in that way. Yeah. Because I, I think when this movie first came out, if I had seen it before COVID, I would have been like, this is an extreme jump to like humanity. But now that I've seen people like videos online of people literally fist fighting over toilet paper, like I could see yeah. the absolute <laughs> buttholes of humanity being like, I need to loot and rob my neighbor now. Yeah, this is this uh, current situation is really bringing out the worst in humanity. But I mean, it's also bringing out a lot of goodness and humanity, too, which is kind of nice to see. Yeah, actually. So um, I work as a videographer and I am like we're not essential business, but we are still able to produce some content uh, following pretty strict guidelines. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we did recently is we shot a demo for a documentary short that we're hoping we can produce the whole thing, but that's contingent on a budget from PBS. But PBS gave us a budget to go shoot a demo, and the idea of it stems off of Mr. Rogers' quote where he says, in times of a crisis, look for the helpers. There's always helpers on the sidelines. Mm -hmm. That's the good in humanity, and they're always there if you look hard enough. And he urges the news to highlight the helpers when they can and so we went out to a uh, elementary school uh, or a, i think it's elementary middle and high school it's in the northern neck of virginia so it's a pretty pretty poor area um, and what they're doing is they realized that there was a need for kids who are underprivileged that need food mm-hmm. and they count on those school lunches exactly. for food yeah. and so what they did is they got volunteers and bus drivers and everybody together and twice a week they are delivering multiple meals at a time uh to any family that is if any member of that family is a student at the school they will deliver a meal um and usually it's like three meals at a time in a bag to every child in that family under the age of 18 over the age of two that's in- that's and, incredible yeah we filmed them packing up uh food for over 600 different kids Damn. and then they deliver them from the buses and, and yeah, all that that, stuff. And that's really exactly cool. what i was getting at we're seeing people who are doing things like that like my one of my best friends she was um in her fourth year of med school um and her rotations got cut off so she's been using all of her time to sew masks right and like sending them out to Very like cool. uh healthcare workers because of course, we have ran out, run out of, you know, medical supplies, which is great to do in a, you know, pandemic, but um, yeah. that's where we can... And then, yeah. not to play devil's advocate, but on the opposite side of things, uh, you have those stories of people who, as soon as this broke out, uh, invested thousands and thousands <laughs> of dollars into buying up uh, bulk hand sanitizer and toilet paper and stockpiling their garages yeah. to then upsell 
and sell to everyone else for 10 times the cost that they bought it yep. for. And they consider themselves entrepreneurs. But they're really and just assholes. Capitalistic. Yeah. Exactly. There's actually my favorite story is one person in Tennessee did that and they bought 17,000 bottles of uh, hand sanitizer. But the, <laughs> then the police were like, you can't sell that because you're a dick. So <laughs> you have to donate it or you're going to jail. So he had to donate all of it. Oh, that's beautiful. I know. It was wonderful. Sweet justice. We love karma. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh,. Contagion isn't the bottom of your list. No. What did Contagion do right? And what did Contagion do wrong? See, I don't know where I would put this movie if I hadn't been watching it, like, right now. You know? Right. Because I'm not... I, I'll be honest, these types of movies aren't, like, my thing. Disease movies. But, you know, one in Rome, right? So, um, mm -hmm. I thought what it did really well is it balanced a... Um, What's the word I'm looking for? Ensemble. Ensemble cast. Because this is kind of an ensemble. That was going to be my next guess of words you were about to pick. Oh, thanks. Yeah, ensemble. <laughs> um, I thought that it got, it, it worked with the characters really well. I, what I thought was crazy is it was not afraid to kill off like big name actors like really yeah. early, which I thought was bold, but awesome. Like Gwyneth Paltrow. Who's mm -hmm. not really in this and movie? And Kate Winslet filmed all of her uh, scenes in like ten days or something like that. Yeah, because she she dies real fast. Which mm -hmm. I mean, I knew Gwyneth Paltrow dies going into this because I think I saw that as a spoiler somewhere. I didn't know that Winslet was gonna die. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I just think that they got like the whole like tone of a pandemic pretty spot on. Yeah, yeah, and uh, so. I, I think what they did right is they tried to create uh, character and story arc mm -hmm. to this pandemic. Um, but I think that was also their downfall because they had so many characters and players, which was realistic mm -hmm. because you've got, you need your connection to a family, yep. you know, like you need someone that you connect with directly. And so that was Matt Damon's family. Like that's what you're meant. You're meant to empathize with him mm -hmm. and his family on a personal level. Um, but the whole like drama with his wife cheating on him and all that stuff, like that was I didn't really so... feel like that was that much of a like drama. It was just more of like the trying to add, another level of mystery to how this disease started and who was patient zero, you know? And I think that was a really realistic part because that's literally what... Um, I mean, I guess. That's what people like, are it, tracking right now. Like, that's what... But I didn't you know? empathize. Like, I, I didn't empathize on a character level. Care. Like, on a way, like, the disease... See, like, that's okay. If, the dis if we're tracking the disease mm -hmm. and all of these characters are just players in the game of the disease mm -hmm. and we don't actually care about them that much, then that's fine. That's, that is the but exact I felt vibe like I, I was, got. That yeah, you're not and that's supposed totally to care that fine. Much. And I think because they keep killing... Off Kept killing off they totally the like, like him him going through the fucking digital camera at the end and seeing pictures and like crying and shit like that sad. was so dumb there's a that's lot the of thing. really see you cared you cared i didn't give a shit fuck that's her because you fuck don't all that about, fuck that whole family he shouldn't be sad things. about her like it's all it, that's so dumb so i, I don't know be i sad. didn't and there's a lot of really sad stories that are happening right now with COVID 19 um so i think that yeah. that added a, the unneeded level of emotion no, it, to tragedy i didn't care human tragedy i didn't care about any of the characters i didn't give a shit all right well you heard it here guys <laughs> but i don't think that was entirely on me i like i no, care about I don't a lot I honestly of characters don't in film and i don't think the film had enough time to really build those characters up and they tried to force that storyline in of the story arc that he faced of like oh there's this pandemic but i'm also realizing that my wife cheated on me and what am i going to do about my daughter and i need to protect her but she's with this guy and it's just like it was too much for the bottle that it was in, considering you also had all of these political players and all of this other stuff happening, which I thought that was my favorite part of the story was like, oh, here is, you know, the uprising, the underground. This is our leader of the anti-government. Like he's fighting for our humanity, but actually he's not. He's just in it for the fucking money. And oh, he got yeah. See, that's what, like that okay, was great. So I know you're, we're, we seem like we disagree a little bit on this whole like ensembleness of this movie and so what i liked mm -hmm. about it is that i could see each character um right now in our current pandemic yeah yeah i yes i agree with you on that and i really think that in order to 
So, like, when we watch ensemble movies that aren't about pandemics, that is the downside usually is that you can't focus on each character. But I think in this case, that was fine. I don't think you're supposed to be super invested in each one. Yeah. So. I just wish I was. Oh, you can like, wish I wish you I were. had more meat there. Yeah. I wish I cared more about the characters, which I could have if it was a smaller, like, 10 Cloverfield Lane. Well, no spoilers for that right now. There's three people but, in it, so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, and that's yeah. that's what that movie does but well, is because movie. you're forced to, to follow these characters so tightly. Mm-hmm. And Contagion, you can't. Unless the movie's, like, six hours long, in which case, like, yeah. no one would have actually followed but it. But isn't through, that kind of what happens know? when you have a disease like this? When you have a disease that's killing people in these large quantities? It, that's the sad part right you right. can't but i also like didn't really like it i don't know like the only reason i cared about kate winslet dying because i was like oh shit she was really good at her job you know like i didn't but that's it, like she? that's important because there are like for example in italy right there's a lot of doctors who are dying so yeah. it, like, that's what, I, no, I, like I get it she, like it's important I don't want to say that, I like that she died that seems like no but it a is harsh. a good arc for the story like yeah. I agree it's a good arc for the story I just wish I cared about her because it didn't for me it didn't seem like oh I'm sad that she's died she died it's more like a, oh shit like this disease can get this everybody is real yeah even yeah. the people who are Nobody's taking safe. the most precautions right yeah no, I agree with that. Um, and and so there's only one more gripe that I'll have with this because we do kind of need to move on 20 yeah. days later here. But uh, the cinematography starts out great. And there's like little bits and pieces of highlights that are fantastic. Like when Gwyneth Paltrow is like getting all diseased and shit and like they do that crazy like super tiny thin uh, area mm-hmm. uh, uh, focus area and like shit like that. Like that's so cool. The mm-hmm. effect is great. But they missed on so many opportunities they had. Like at the beginning, there were a lot of vast color differences. And a lot of it gave you the sick feeling. It had this like orange and yellow tone yeah, to it. Yeah, it made them and look so like you all feel jaundiced. ill. It's disgusting. Yeah. It's like green <laughs> and it's like, oh, this isn't, you know, and you're like, you realize it, you know, it's there. It's very prevalent. And then when they show Matt Damon for the first time, he's going to pick up um, his kid from school. Uh, it's very blue it's very cold and it's very like okay like this mm-hmm. he's okay he's not feeling sick even though sickness is here he's not feeling sick and i can tell because of the color palette but then they go through the rest of the movie and they just completely wash that idea out the window it's yeah. like they had the idea and they started to do it and then they were like yeah i don't know we're not gonna like worry about like hammering this down when they could have actually put in really awesome subtle color differences in the color palette to make you feel a certain way about characters who was safe who wasn't who was feeling it who wasn't uh, but they kind of just threw that out the window and it, yeah. it felt sloppy to me no see and we've talked about this on other podcasts the like difference between a movie and a film and this mm-hmm. is a movie right yeah and the, that's the thing it could have like it was very close to being able to be a film it showed so much promise yeah. it did and it's so like when i have the, I, I put this as third so i i mean that's not that high on my list that's but we're gonna pretty... have some words when Ten Cloverfield Lane comes back around. <laughs> That's like what your second favorite? Yeah. Well, you put the masterpiece Children of Men very, very low. So I, we, we're gonna have words I'll then talk about too. That. Okay. Yeah. That's fine. We can talk. Because that just talk. objectively I have my the reasons. best movie of all four of these. <laughs> best film all right so let's move on to 28 days later so you you mentioned that there was a tie here um between contagion 28 days later you want to talk about them as a group why oh sorry um so i felt there was a tie here because these are the only two movies that we really have like an actual pandemic happen right of the two movies Mm -hmm. of the four movies we watched because we'll, we'll we'll get into children of men but that's not really like a virus it's like mm-hmm. it's very different. It's kind of like a collapse of society, somewhat related to mental right. illness, but it's different. So I felt like Twenty Eight Days Later and Contagion are the two movies that are like, here's a virus. It is really contagious. It's destroying humanity. How do we get through it? And I felt like Contagion is like the more accurate movie, obviously, because <laughs> <laughs> Twenty Eight Days Later. What makes you say that? Has zombies. Um. <laughs> But I felt like I felt like there was a lot of overlap between the two movies. I don't know. Did you feel that way at all? Kind of. Like I get what you're saying as far as like theme goes yeah. to what we're doing with our podcast. But if you look at them as movies, I think they're completely different. Oh, completely. But they it, just both are I, like, here's a virus. How do we respond to that? 
How do we move yeah. on? And that's why when we talked about doing a sort of apocalypse, yeah. like a zombie movie, you were like, why don't we do Shaun of the Dead? Like, I love I Shaun love of the Dead. Movie. I do. Uh, yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. But I want to do 20 Days Later because it is like officially it's a virus. Mm-hmm. You know, like, that's what it is. It's not, you know, oh, the dead's rising. Yeah. Like, they're technically not dead. Yeah. It's just an extremely, like, it's they're a the bloodborne yeah. virus. That's what they're and, called. And it, it's, it's the rage virus. And so it, it infects you, and you just go into this maniac craze where all you want to do is rip apart whoever's in front of mm-hmm. you. And the idea was that, like, they didn't want to do... Um, they didn't want to, they were tired of the whole like brain eating zombies yeah. so they wanted to do something different and this is the first uh iteration of zombies that like sprint and run after you yeah, they're not, not these crazy slow zombies. like they're terrifying <laughs> and so what i love about 20 days later and i'm going to nerd out about this after we get done talking about the whole virus thing but it, it was the first like it was the re kickstart mm-hmm. of the zombie franchise like it was like uh, and I love zombies. We it, it, Night of the Living Dead kicked things off with the first brain eating, like flesh eating zombies. Like that was like a whole new level of terror. And then we had a couple of movies, and then it faded off. And then we had Twenty Eight Days Later, and then it kicked off the entire new like gave birth to so many movies: Resident Evil, Shaun of the Dead, Day of the Dead, Planet Terror, Zombie Land, World War Z. Like <laughs> none of those movies would have happened if Twenty Eight Days Later hadn't. And happened. that's why we picked this one over all those movies. Yes. Yes, I and it I had me. never seen this movie until last night, and I you I think? really liked it. Um, I didn't know that the it was the same director. It was Danny Boyle. I didn't know that um, it was the same director as Train Spotting. But if you've seen Train Spotting, you can definitely tell very mm-hmm. similar film styles. Which so mm-hmm. and I think you're either gonna love that or you're gonna hate it. I don't I don't think yeah. yeah. So like for example, and- Connor, my boyfriend wasn't the biggest fan of this movie really yeah oh so good uh, <laughs> i know he's, he's wrong, wrong. <laughs> um <laughs> but yeah it, the danny boyle train spotting thing uh ewan mcgregor was actually um was going to play the part of Jim or was going to be asked but they had like a bit of a falling out and they were gonna ask um, ryan gosling and i'm very yeah. upset that this movie did not have him in it but but it's kind of good because no. the gritty disgusting feel of it because you hit me up and you were like hey is this movie supposed to look like shit <laughs> i did not say that that way <laughs> no you didn't you didn't but those are my yes. words but that's essentially like and i thought the same thing when i first saw this movie this was also before i did film school or any of that mm-hmm. i didn't know anything about film when i first saw this movie i was like oh man this movie just must be really old because it looks like shit but it's not like it's meant to look crazy and weird and jarring yeah. and disgusting and it's not in just like we're gonna change the color palette they like one this was the one of the first mainstream movies to be shot on digital and not film mm-hmm. so that was a huge it's 2002 uh that was a huge uh change for people but also a big reason for shooting digital was they had to shoot on location at a bunch of like deserted massive streets and so they had to get police to close off these locations at the brink of sunrise mm-hmm. when they barely had enough light and they only had like an hour or two so they needed stuff they could set up real fast yeah. so they could set up like they shot on the m1 and and they shot on a Sunday morning from 7 to 9 a.m. They set up 10 cameras, and the police would slow traffic as much as possible while still being able to get people through. Right. And between that whole time, they only got a minute of usable <laughs> footage where everything was completely deserted. Fuck. 10 cameras. So 10 <laughs> cameras to get a minute of usable footage. That sounds miserable. And so, like... Yeah, so you had to shoot digital. You couldn't set mm-hmm. up this massive camera and get this epic cinematography shot. Like, you had to shoot digital. Another reason for that is they could shoot at a frame rate of 1,200 frames per second. So they did that for the zombie shots. When zombies are running around, we're just going to call them zombies, infected, whatever. They're the infected. When yes. zombies are running around 1,200 frames per second, which played back, normally if you shoot that on film, that'll play back in slow motion because you're shooting at a higher frame rate rather than 24. But when you play that at 24 frames per second, when you shot at 1,200, it plays at 24 frames, but it gives this jarring because it's like it's like more added frames. You don't get that natural cinema, cinematic motion mm-hmm. blur. And it gives you this really jarring, like weird feeling of like, why does it look like mm-hmm. this? It looks like shit and like it's jumpy and like it's because there's so 
so many frames thrown in and it doesn't give you this smooth it's not a 60 frames per second slow-mo like it's a very jarring thing and so they did that and then they also did it for the end uh when jim is like fighting back mm. to kind of give a similarity between the zombie threat and then the gym threat and i know i had asked you this last night um did you have a chance to watch the other ending no, I didn't. I meant to watch it today. So there's a whole alternative ending if you watch this. It's at the end of the credits. Um, I don't know if I should tell you what happens or not. I can tell you. Well, I read that there were alternate endings. I mean, it's he fine. Dies. Uh, That's there's, it. Yeah, yeah he, he dies in a couple different ones, right? How does he die, though? Because I don't uh, know. He just has, like, you, do you, you know in the original ending how he has that, like, wound? I barely remember okay, a wound. Okay, so he's got a wound, right? And then they fix it. You know how he has that like um, bandage on his stomach when he mm-hmm. wakes up in the bed, so that mm-hmm. he dies from that, basically. Uh, yeah. So yeah, they rush him to a hospital. They try to save him. He dies. At the end. All right. Yeah. Interesting. So. Um, yeah, because in the original ending, which was the one that I saw, which I guess happens before the credits, anyway. So you saw the regular ending. Yeah. So like, basically, right? how it goes is they have the regular ending with the pilot, you know, like flying over mm-hmm. uh, credits, and then at the very end, it says, "But what if?" and then plays that ending. Oh, yeah. interesting. It's, it's fun. Yeah. It, so one of the fun facts for Twenty Eight Days Later, I wrote down, which I didn't know until I, I looked some stuff up. Um, so the pilot speaks in Finnish. Mm-hmm. Um, when he's going over and, um, where is it? I wrote it down cause I don't want to get the quote wrong. Uh, so the last words are, will you send a helicopter? So when, when he says, do you think he saw us this time? When Jim says, do you think he saw us this time? Um, and then we're left to wonder maybe he did, maybe he didn't. Who knows? Uh, that sort of Finnish language, like it, it's almost an Easter egg because who speaks Finnish? You know, uh, I mean, there are Finland, some people, but, but that's about but, it. <laughs> but but most people wouldn't catch mm-hmm. on to the fact that like that pilot was uh, yes, he did see them and tries to radio in and see if someone will send a helicopter to to check them out. But then again, you also don't know if it's going to be a good thing that they send somebody. Well, I interpreted that scene as the fact that there is somebody out there because didn't they talk about this in the movie that this might be isolated to England or did I make that up? No, you did. I did make and that that's up, where or I did 28, hear this. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's that's like that's right. the thing is they. So they the fact that there's a Finnish person flying over England means that that's correct. Yeah, which is good. And and so uh, the idea of 28 weeks later, which I don't believe this is a spoiler in any way. It's just the plot of 28 weeks later is that uh, the outbreak is failing to be contained into one uh, country. Mm. So. That's what twenty eight weeks later mm-hmm. comes in. That's that's fun. Twenty eight weeks later is really good, and it's it's filmed more cinematically. Yeah. So it doesn't have that like gritty, dirty, disgusting. Like it's more, I guess, user friendly right. of a movie. You you'd enjoy that if you like twenty eight days later. Yeah. Doesn't touch it as far as the character building goes. And that's what I really liked about this movie is that it it wasn't necessarily about like killing zombies. It was kind of like how do you get through something that, that is this traumatic? There's lots of different ways mm-hmm. you can process like your parent dying or you know having to kill one of your friends or or being kidnapped by the military to be turned into a sex slave like all sorts of crazy <laughs> themes that are happening yeah and i think that is also pretty original as far as 28 days later goes as far as like apocalyptic mm-hmm. and zombie films go i mean night of the living dead is like you can't touch that for that to come out in 1968 and to be so revolutionary from zombies and then mm-hmm. also have this political undertone and to also star an african-american in 1968 and like not raise awareness to that really mm-hmm. is like that's that's incredible um that film oh man George A. Romero, rest in peace. Like, what a god. We do not deserve him. Yeah. Uh, so uh, for this to come out and sort of ride on the coattails of that, but also say, like, yes, like, here's another apocalyptic movie, but the highlight isn't that. Yeah. What we are focusing on is, like you said, complete humanity mm-hmm. and the best and the worst of humanity. And, and, it, and it proves that human beings left to their own devices can be just as haunting as flesh eating rage filled yeah. sprinting zombies like how <laughs> terrifying is that it's almost like humans are the monsters i don't know Maybe oh, almost, almost. <laughs> um 
Yeah, so that's that's what I absolutely loved about this movie. Yeah. Is not only not only is it a, an amazing um, tone on humanity and and what could happen in an apocalypse, mm-hmm. but it's also so revolutionary for the zombie franchise. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just I I uh, I mean I'm sure I would have said this before this movie came out um, that nothing would ever touch the likes of Night of the Living Dead as far as like this sort of zombie horror goes. Uh, this kind of does um it creates a brand new staple and a brand new chapter in zombie films and now we're declining again now zombies are boring again i've always been obsessed with zombies (laughs) now zombies are boring again we had zombie land too but who cares that's you know like people don't care about zombies anymore no so it's gonna take another like something like Mm -hmm. this to come out that's going to kickstart it again just like i mean it happens with everything like slashers come back Mm -hmm. like you know zombies will come back Mm -hmm. but we're gonna have to give it another 20 years i think well i thought what this movie did differently about viruses than contagion is i think that it um the reason i wanted to pair those two together is because these are probably the only movies we're going to talk about like the actual disease for um it's interesting that it complete this movie completely skips the outbreak part you know you yeah. go from like yeah. page zero, patient zero, right? The girl who gets bitten by the chimp to mm-hmm. 28 days later, uh, an abandoned London. So we completely miss yeah. the falling out of society in this movie. Which, mm-hmm. which is beautifully mm-hmm. uh, written as far as him waking up in a hospital. I mean, that draws off of <laughs> yeah. Day of the Triffids, uh-huh. which is like an amazing book that i've been halfway through for years now um but it draws off a day of the triffids where the guy wakes up in the hospital and we don't know what has happened and we slowly get to fill in those pieces as the novel goes on um but stuff like uh way the dude dude from walking dead rick waking up in a hospital which i just don't completely draws off just just as a side nitpick how did he happen to not get eaten by an infected person while he was in the hospital. How do all of these people in zombie movies magically not die while they're unconscious in a hospital when they're the only people there? It's a good question. <laughs> uh, maybe the key to surviving the infected is Being to a coma. play dead. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pretend like you're dead and they don't care. I guess that is it. Because that, that was my only, like, hmm, about this movie. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's like the- yeah, especially there's no one else even in the hospital. Yeah, like... Doesn't seem re- like yeah. It doesn't seem realistic at all. So the zombie I've movie is not facts. realistic enough for me. So <laughs> I've got some fun facts for both Contagion and Twenty Eight Days Later. So I'll start with Twenty Eight Days Later. I'll go back to Contagion. Um, but uh, so you mentioned this already is based on Ebola, uh, which you know the rash, the red eyes, the external bleeding, the internal bleeding, all that stuff based on Ebola. That's how they got their ideas. Um, of the rage virus. I talked about the frame rate and all that stuff. I don't know why I put that as a fun fact. <laughs> I knew a, I was going to nerd that's a out fun about fact that during only the movie. For you. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, talked about Ryan Gosling. Um, so one of the interesting things is the scene where Jim and Selena are celebrating with Frank and Hannah. Mm-hmm. That scene was shot on 9 11, mm-hmm. 2001. So that and they specifically said they were like it felt really weird like that is the like most happy anyone is in the entire movie Mm -hmm. you know and so that is like uh they said it was really weird to be celebrating and to have this happy point of this like disastrous Mm -hmm. movie uh apocalypse movie happen on the day that the trade towers were attacked i bet if this was an american film production that they wouldn't have done that they wouldn't have filmed that day. Should just shut down. Yeah. I'm sure. Um, they also said, so when the movie came out, uh, the scene where Jim is walking around and he's seeing all the missing posters and stuff like in the town square. Um, apparently after this movie came out, people were criticizing it because of 9-11. They were saying like, that's insensitive for you to include something like that when 9-11 happened and that sort of thing was happening and people were missing their loved ones. And um, they said that it, they wouldn't have included it yeah. if they had shot it like after, like they wouldn't have shot mm-hmm. it after nine eleven happened. But since they shot it sequentially and they had already shot that, they they felt like they should leave mm-hmm. it in. Um, yeah. But a lot of things like that, like really hit 
uh, close to home from these huge yeah. disasters. You want to hear a fun 9-11 fact? <laughs> Give me all of your fun 9-11 facts, Kelsey. the worst way you could possibly, especially with what I'm about to say, <laughs> so I'm so sorry for saying that, everybody. Um, but more New Yorkers have now died from coronavirus than, nine, than they did in 9-11. Whoa. Yeah. That is how serious this disease really is. So, Damn. That's a fun fact. That is such a fun fact. Thank you, You're, Kelsey, for that fun, fun fact. You're welcome. It's not a fun fact. That's um, a sad fact. Yeah. So I didn't write a lot of specifics, um, but if you want to go back and search through the IMDb fun facts <laughs> page, uh, you can find these specifics. But there are a lot of shots and ideas from 28 Days Later that came from old photographs um, of, uh, or no, maybe this is Children of Men. Um, one or the other, you know, <laughs> I should have done my research, but this isn't spoilery, but a lot of like photo uh, things that happen are taken from, uh, photographs of these like disastrous events. Like there was something with Pol Pot and all that. And like some photograph of something. That seems very children of men. It does. I think it's children since of men. That is a very, very realistic, wary, yeah. pandemic y, apocalyptic y. Movie. So we'll get back to that. I'll <laughs> I'll pull up a page and give some specifics. Yeah. Um, Maybe we when, should when do Children some research in, yeah. between now and then. Yeah, I've got it. I've already got it up on well, my computer right so now. No so excuses. we'll we'll talk about it okay. more when we do Children of Men. Um, and then so Contagion. Uh, I wanted to mention a couple of fun facts because they have one of the coolest promos. And I should have looked up like a video or something <laughs> about this. Um, but this promo is awesome. So they sent two giant petri dishes with bacteria and fungi to a storefront in Toronto. They put them up in these <laughs> giant windows in the storefront. And over the course of several days, the bacteria and fungi manifested to spell out the name of the film and biohazard symbols. Okay, that's pretty awesome. How? How badass that's is that? Like that's but that's pretty cool. Oh, <laughs> who came up with that idea? That's fucking genius. I don't know. Some disease expert. I don't know, man. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, the disease in Contagion was based off of traits of the, and I'm going to butcher this name, the Nipah virus from uh, Malaysia in the late 1990s. And so as of 2018, there were around 700 confirmed cases. It had a 50 to 75% fatality rate. Shit, that's... How insane is that? That is not... Fucking terrifying. Good. And so that that disease evolved from swines. Mm. And so they this resulted in millions of pigs being killed to prevent the outbreak mm. of this disease. I mean, I guess you got to do what you got to do, but that sucks. Yeah, that's in some intense shit. And I had never even heard of yeah. that until I looked this shit up. But yeah, that was what the uh, contagion disease was based off of. Yeah. Um, and that's all I got for those two. I tried to look up the fatality rate for COVID-19 and it's really just difficult to do because A, it requires math and B, uh, <laughs> it just affects so many populations completely differently. That it really depends mm -hmm. on your age group, your health conditions, your uh, country. Like, for example, Germany and Italy have about the same amount of cases, but 20,000 people in Italy have died and 3,000 in Germany have died. So it's it's really hard to tell how deadly it really is. That's some intense it shit. It just means that Germany is doing something right, but I don't know what it is. Yeah. Speaking German, likely. It is. They're scaring it because it's a scary sounding language <laughs> um so box office for contagion contagion had a 60 million dollar budget which probably a shit ton of that went into the cast yeah <laughs> um opening weekend made 22.4 million okay and i remember opening weekend because i uh made a trip on um with some people from camp for our, our buddy's bachelor party we took him to atlantic city mm -hmm. And we all joined like a random poker tournament 
which we thought would be fun, even though we obviously aren't professional gamblers or anything, mm-hmm. but it was like a $30 buy-in. And then we got like two hours of playing poker. You lose $30 at a slot table in 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. So we figured it was a good use of our money. And it was a lot of fun to do an actual poker tournament in Atlantic city. And I was like barely 21 at the mm-hmm. time. So I was a little baby. I didn't know what I was doing, but it was really fun. But one person in our group refused to play. And we were like, dude, just play. Like, it's all right. Like, you know, we're just doing it for fun. Like we're, no one's going to win. Uh, but he didn't want to do it. So he went and watched contagion instead. And we gave him endless amounts of shit for that. Um, but you know, well, I bet he came out of that. That's why I remember opening. Cause weekend. the, the first patient zero gets infected in a casino, right? So I yeah. bet he was like, yeah, I didn't even huh. think about that. <laughs> Y'all are going to die now. <laughs> I didn't even think about that. Um, but opening weekend, it made $22.4 million, uh, would come to gross worldwide at $136.5 That's million. That's crazy, because I've literally... Which is higher than any of these four I've films. I've literally never heard of this movie until BuzzFeed posted about it, like, a month ago. Yeah. So. Yep. Hmm. Um, and then 28 days later, a measly budget of 8 million compared to the 60 million, which is surprising considering the set design and like closing off streets and areas like that's like not a big budget for this. They probably did the crazy shots with the infected to like probably mask some type of low budget special effects with them. That was kind of what I was guessing. I I mean, I'd imagine, like, shooting on film is obviously more expensive, yeah. but shoot, in 2002, digital wasn't cheap. Like, now it's cheap because storage is cheap. You can have drives. You have bigger cameras, yeah. lots of competition. But, I mean, you, but in 2002, it wasn't But if you don't, cheap. like, show the zombies, then, you know, it saves you a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. I and also, they also, all of the, um, a lot of them were just college students that they didn't pay. So, yeah, <laughs> that also saves you <laughs> a lot of money. Which I would have been in it. I yeah. totally would have been in it. <laughs> Um, it would come to open at 10 million. So they're nice. already profitable. Open weekend. Uh, would come to worldwide gross at $85.7 million. I wish I had that. That would be nice. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the fun thing about horror is a lot of horror is really, really low budget and it's an extremely hit or miss. I mean, the, the beautiful thing about horror is you're always going to have, uh, your diehard fan base. I'll go see any horror movie and mildly enjoy it. The fucking bye bye man complete shit i had fun (laughs) i really enjoyed it like i don't know why Mm -hmm. but like it's Mm -hmm. you'll always have your audience with horror that will go and enjoy any horror movie at the same time if you make a good horror then people like me will also enjoy it you're gonna make money man because your budget is so low and if you happen to have a hit like that's it well good for good for mr boyle so good for mr (laughs) boyle um yeah, so let's move on. So we're moving to on to chapter. our new topic slash movie, which is quarantining slash ten Cloverfield Lane place lane. lane. All right, I was right the lane. first time. It's a lane. Um, yeah. So spoilers for Ten Cloverfield Lane. So all right, so I watched this movie and I liked this movie. Give me your juicy, uh, juicy juice. But I didn't really like the last fifteen minutes of this movie. Mm-hmm. I, is it just because aliens is that like i mean yeah i didn't feel like it was needed i felt like if she could oh it was absolutely no. all right hear me out yes Here, hear me out all right give me a full character arc that <laughs> okay, doesn't so, end in aliens well i thought it would have been kind of cool if it had not not necessarily aliens but the whole like actually having to see the alien i don't know okay first off i'm not really that into alien movies like at all they're probably my least no, well, I like Alien, but that's like the only. There aren't many good Alien movies. No, that's the there's problem. like the Alien. The problem is there aren't many good Alien. There's movies. Independence Day, which is like has Jeff Goldblum, so we'll, we'll take it. <laughs> so it gets a pass. <laughs> but I don't, I don't like them. Maybe, and I, I thought, I don't know. I felt like if it had movie, basically, if I had made this movie, I would have ended it with her leaving the bunker and us having no idea what was out there, and that would have been it. And I. But that doesn't give the full well, character arc. I don't care. This is my movie now. That's what I would have done. <laughs> it's not your movie. No, I'm the not. captain now. I mean, that's the thing. Like, I just uh, if if you write off a movie simply because I it has aliens, I didn't say I was writing it off. I, I know, just felt. I know. I'm not saying you. I'm just saying that I I want to make sure that's not your take on it because yeah. you can't just be like, oh, alien. Like, yes, in some movies, 
oh, Aliens is a terrible, terrible, terrible sell. Because it's like, you have all of this mystery, and you're like, oh, Aliens, of course it's mysterious and no one yeah. knows. But, like, some Alien movies are fucking beautiful. But the, so like, this Arrival, is, dude? This oh. is what I didn't like, is that the, like, the majority of the movie didn't feel like an Alien movie, and then... All right. of a sudden, it was an alien movie, and I was like, mm -hmm. nah, "Which not for that me. plays into it, though, because the entire movie, you're like, what is real and what isn't? Is she actually being held hostage? Yes. Wait, maybe not. Oh, yeah, she definitely is. Maybe not. Oh, well, alien is is the apocalypse real? Is this shit that's going down outside real? And then you see the woman come up to the bunker, and you're like, oh, yeah, some weird shit's going on, but she's fine. The atmosphere is fine. And then you see her fucking dissolve in front of you, and you're like, holy shit, this is real. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, wait a minute, what if it's not? Because she's clearly being held here, captive. So, I like, liked what all, is the I deal? liked all of that. I'm just saying I didn't— per That's the beautiful I've, part. Because that's even the good after part she goes it. out— I'm saying I didn't necessarily like the ending where she comes out and has to suddenly fight against— <laughs> Aliens. I'm like, this, the, it, it just for me, it like, I'm not, I liked this movie. Okay. I liked this movie yeah. overall. I'm just saying. But it's your least favorite. I liked the other ones more. Sorry. <laughs> I'm allowed. I don't really. Get, as long as you I liked it. it. I thought it fine. was really fun and really good. And I thought it really, really captured being quarantined right now. But it just, mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. that was just a big show, um, tone shift for me that I didn't fully. So, appreciate but i, I so feel like why yeah, why this is important though why this is important is michelle's story arc so this is one of the <sighs> best female empowerment story arcs that i have ever seen in a film because she starts out she doesn't speak for the first 10 minutes of the movie 10 minutes in she says her first word and she is a victim of an abusive relationship is what we can assume with her finally leaving her boyfriend which is voiced by bradley cooper by the way well, that's a she fact. finally leaves her boyfriend it is <laughs> and uh and leaves the engagement ring on the table and pieces out and then gets hit by the car wakes up in this bunker she is completely she she shows a little glimpse of power with her finally leaving her relationship but even when she's calling him and talking or she's he's calling her and talking to her she's listening mm -hmm. you know she's listening which gives you the the idea that maybe she hasn't like is she actually going to be able to escape and then she wakes up in this bunker and she's completely powerless and the cool thing is throughout this film you see her resilience and you see it start to build at first she's powerless she's slowly developing these better ideas to get out and just when you're like oh dude like she's just screwed she's just gotta like stay in and hope hope for the best and she never gives up she continues with these plans even till it comes to the point of burning this bunker down even after she's seen someone in the outside atmosphere like she knows she's entering extreme danger but she's also in extreme danger yeah. and she's gonna be the one to fight to get out no one's gonna save her she has to get out herself but like why does she and have then, to fight aliens for the last 10 minutes this is the thing and then and then <sighs> she gets out uh -huh. right so she gets out of her captive her captivity but that can be written off as escaping like one bad situation you don't know how much a character has learned but to have her sit there and fight these aliens one not give up and fight these aliens, get back into her suit when the shit starts to come down. Like, she's thinking fast, and she's smart, and she's resilient, mm. and she's powerful, and she's beating this alien race all by herself in a fucking jumpsuit mm -hmm. with no weapons or anything like that she finally gets the car and she gets to drive away, and she's trying to find safety, and she barely hears over the radio, we are attacking the race, we need help in Houston, if you have any military experience or emt experience which she doesn't have <laughs> please come and help us we are winning this but we need more people or she could go straight into the safe zone and there's that moment of i can escape i have this or i can turn and drive right into the front lines of battle and that's what she does and that's the biggest change of character because uh, at the beginning of the movie not having gone through this whole quarantine thing she never would have chosen to go to houston to fight the aliens one-on-one -on -one, but she does so it's the best story arc. i do have a question if you've seen cloverfield are the aliens the same no the different aliens 
but there are aliens. We can assume that it's like it's like this giant brown like sort of alien T Rex looking monster. So it's sort of like a massive version of the little tiny ones. We can well, assume it's the same alien it, race, so but we don't really know. So I think maybe I would have liked this movie better if there had been more time spent on this whole like alien part because it mm-hmm. just it felt very literally like 15 minutes maybe even 10 minutes of just nonsense in my opinion but i liked the rest of the movie (laughs) well you're not a nerd i just don't really like aliens unless jeff goldblum's fighting them or sigourney weaver i'm sorry i have standards okay (laughs) those are like really high bars if you have if you have actual standards this would meet your standards Mm. But anyway, let's it's talk so about good. things beside aliens because that doesn't fit into our <laughs> chapter right now, which is quarantine. <laughs> yeah, I got really excited about so. that. I'm sorry. I, I do. I love this movie. Cloverfield is okay to me. Okay. It's okay. It's a fun found footage film. It's okay. Cloverfield Paradox, garbage. Duly 10 noted. Cloverfield Lane, I w- fucking I won't perfect. watch either not of just them, be- so okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, not just because of aliens, but like just if we just talk about the quarantine aspect. Which of, I think like, is what this-, this movie is great about this movie movie absolutely like, so absolutely. let's talk about good and things and it is it, it is the epitome of character building and drama mm-hmm. like to have the th- like the set design is fucking perfect and have those three people in the bunker and have all of this tension and drama built in like there is not a moment of rest in that movie it is it flows so fucking well for glimmer and moments of mm-hmm. hope to absolute disaster really intense yeah. like little things as far as eating dinner and building a puzzle and watching fucking 16 candles like all of this is like the most terrifying there were were some really good details that they put in too like i don't know if you noticed like her she came into the bunker with her nails like perfectly done but as the movie progressed they like had been kept wearing away yeah so it was like so like it was like half chipped and then towards the end they were completely gone which Oh. I mean, it's happening now to people if you had your nails done and then all the nail salons closed, right? <laughs> right. But like yeah, little, I shaved my head. I, yes, we see that. That was a that was a choice. That, that was a made. choice. A lot of people are doing that. You are our friend Elliot also shaved his head. So twinsies. Yeah. Um, but like little details like that, or like that they only have like two or three outfits each. You know, like things mm-hmm. like that. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, the thing that's beautiful, too, is that every single little prop Mm -hmm. has a story and a reason. Mm -hmm. Like I was thinking today, I didn't even think about this when I was watching the movie, but the puzzle that um, what's his name Emmett finishes Mm -hmm. or like finishes, but there's like six missing pieces like at first time I watched that, I just kind of wrote it off as like, oh, yeah, it's just missing pieces of a puzzle. But like the reason those pieces are missing is because it's been used before that puzzle has been put together before those pieces yeah. have been lost and not found which given uh friggin um dude man's nature of everything has to be perfect in my way like there's no there's no way if he was putting that puzzle together there's no way those pieces would have been lost mm-hmm. like somehow so it could have even been a sign from um what's her name not megan um kidnapped girl the girl that Brittany, it could have even been Brittany that intentionally took those pieces and hid them in the case of like if she disappeared, Mm -hmm. like and if somebody did like somebody's been here before, it could even be a sign like every little tiny thing, every can of soda, Uh, like, you know, everything has a reason to be oriented. Yeah, I know in a really, really good way. Yeah, incredible. And for this to be um, Dan Trachtenberg, his first Featured directorial debut. Phenomenal well, job him. directing. Unreal. And the thing is, like, I don't know, I don't know why he didn't do more. Because after this, he does I think he did like a couple episodes of TV and mm-hmm. stuff, but like he hasn't done a major feature film since since 10 Cloverfield Lane. And like, what an amazing film to direct and do it so perfectly. Like, what the fuck are you doing, Dan? Get back on the horse. I want to see some more shit from Maybe you, bud. Maybe he rewatched this movie and then saw the last, like, ten minutes. And, you know... Oh, you shut the <laughs> hell up. I was like, maybe I should do something else. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh man, I thought it was absolutely perfect. Um, the only reason Twenty Eight Days Later I liked more than this is because of like the whole zombie thing and being such a staple staple in the franchise. Yeah. But Twenty it, it, Ten Cloverfield Lane, especially this is my second time watching it, and the second time watching it feels so much better too because you do realize what's going to happen yeah. and you realize little things like why Dude Man doesn't want uh, her to see certain right. things or go into certain places or like. Like, you know, um, oh, it's incredible. No, it was good. It, it's good. I think I have it as what last. Yes, I put it last. And I stand by that choice. Um, I have, in my mind, I have the movies of these four at the bottom. Contagion and this one. They feel like... This was absolutely a film. Okay. The amount of detail that goes into this and the cinematography and everything, like, absolutely. Everything is so perfectly placed and executed. 100% of film. Okay. Well. Not even a fucking question. But anyway, in my opinion, I would say this is more. It's not here or there. You're just well, wrong. Okay, well, here or there. Uh, in my opinion, I would say <laughs> this is a movie, right? And I think that maybe we aren't using the same definitions with movie and film. Like, I think. Oh, we are. Okay. Well, I feel very attacked right now then for having an opinion. As you should. This is film strippers, <laughs> okay. man. This is back to the roots. Oh, God. This is back to season I'm two. I'm going to leave now. I'm just going to shut my laptop and close out a Zoom and <laughs> go finish my puzzle that I was working on before this. Yeah, well, you're going to be missing six I pieces, and then it turns my... out Connor is going to dissolve you in a vat of acid. It would be very uh, breaking bad of him, so <laughs> hope he doesn't use our bathtub. Um <laughs> Anyway, what I was saying is film, uh, movies for me like are just kind of like good. They could be good still. I'm not saying that they, have, they can't be good. But this this was just a movie for entertainment, right? Like I didn't feel like there was anything more to it than just this is a really fun movie. To me, the film, uh, once you reach the part of being a film, films, uh, yes, movies are entertainment. Mm -hmm. Films are more than that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I agree with you in the part that this doesn't really have, like, those political undertones. It does, it's missing it doesn't have that any narrative about like, humanity. Days like, later I, or yeah, Children I agree of Men, with that. which we will be getting into. I agree but. with that, but I will say it where it does take a step above just being a movie is this super careful and perfectly executed uh, character arc yeah. and narration like all of that is so perfect and and so detail oriented and every mm -hmm. little prop every little thing has a reason and we we don't just get like here's what's happening to our right. characters what we get is here are our characters here's what they're going through and how they change that's what puts it a step above a movie for me oh and that's just like your opinion well, that's your just opinion, like your opinion own. man so <laughs> i'm not um, saying i don't this, like it i really no, no, i enjoy I, this that, movie that's cool that's that's a good explanation it's not something that's I, would fair. Do. I don't i wouldn't have watched this movie unless like you had picked it it's not something i'm glad i, I did would, i enjoyed it i think are you, yeah you're glad you watched it right yeah it's good it, yeah i wouldn't want to be stuck in that bunker during covid19 oh no that sounds awful <laughs> um Ten Cloverfield Lane, uh, as you are, you already know this, but I made a short film when I was a film student called Arboretum. Uh, this had a lot of influence on our original Arboretum script because our our whole thing, my my story arc of the main character is I wanted her to be in this sort of abusive, emotionally abusive relationship that she finally breaks mm -hmm. free from. Uh, but the trials that she has to go through to gain that strength to break free from the relationship. And there's a weird alien monster creature in my movie, which isn't quite the same as this because the monster sort of is her. Um, it's, it, the monster plays a physical manifestation of uh, the strength that she is gaining through the turmoil of what she has gone through. Um, which is, is I loved that aspect of it, but I pulled that from Cloverfield mm -hmm. a little bit, uh, in the whole main story arc. And then, and then, uh, her finally, uh, coming to a closure and breaking free from the woods, the Arboretum, uh, and then making the choice to follow her, her dreams. <laughs> I had to tell it in seven minutes, <laughs> which I did in 15 minutes, but, <laughs> you yeah. know, it wasn't a two hour film, but it was the same sort of story arc. I borrowed a lot from Arboretum, yeah. or from, from this for Arboretum. 
Yeah. Well, look at you go. Um, the last thing I'll say, I got one more fun <laughs> fact for Tank okay. Field, and then we'll we'll carry on. <clears throat> so in there's a featurette that contains this timeline, and I didn't see this featurette. I just picked this up online. Um, but it gives a timeline of uh, the building of the bunker and what was happening um, to Howard. And so... Is that Dude Man? Uh, in ni- yeah. Dude Man. Okay. Dude Man Howard. <laughs> uh, Howard is a weird name to me because now I just think of... Howard uh, the Duck? Uncut Gems. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but that's another good that's Howard. That's the best Howard. Uh, <laughs> 1992, um, Howard moved to the farmhouse of his family. 1993, his daughter Megan is six months old. He built the airlock and the main exit stairs and then the bedroom bathroom mm-hmm. that he uses. 1999, Megan is six years old. He builds the living room, the kitchen, the generator room, uh, which is where um, Michelle eventually goes and finds the yeah. earring of Brittany. And that's how she gets out, right? Uh, mm-hmm. No, that, that's, she gets out through the main exit eventually. I thought but she, she like, the freezes help. the lock. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah you're, right, you're right, you're right, you're right. Yeah, yeah. Yep, you're I, right, you're I right. watched this yeah. movie, and I didn't even did. like this part of the movie. <laughs> You had to like that at least yeah, for getting like that part. You didn't I'm like kidding. it when they That was show. fun. Um, and uh, and he built the second bathroom or storage room, mm-hmm. which would eventually turn into his like I am kidnapping you room. Uh, in 2008, Megan is 15 years old. He builds the new generator room, the storage hallway. Uh, oh, Michelle's room is built here. Sorry. And then the little nook, which was labeled as Kyle's nook. Yeah. So Emmett's character was almost n- n- named Kyle. Um, and then in 2010, Howard's wife and daughter leave him, which I thought it was really cool to not give a reason why his family left him or where they mm-hmm. were. He left that as a mystery. I thought that was really neat. Um, and then 2012, two years later, is n- labeled as Megan Prime, which is the abduction of Brittany. And then 2015, all it says is now Megan is 22 and in college. And then we and have then, 10 Cloverfield and Lane, Aliens, which was 2010, but, right? I, I didn't look good about that. I, I wrote this down. Was it really that long ago? No way. I th- maybe not. Where did I write it we down? We do our research here. We Children of Memphis, 2006. Uh-huh. 2016. That is a, I was going to say, that's a big difference. That's a significant jump. Yeah. Well, that, that would, would make sense, sense to 2015. Right, yeah, right yeah. before your, I'm an idiot. Uh, your Arboretum, too. Arboretum, yeah. yeah. We know All facts right. here at Film Strippers. Fun facts. We know when the years of these movies that we've done in-depth research for come out. Mm-hmm. So that's 10 Cloverfield yeah. Lane. And so... Obviously not the worst of our uh, four films. Um, okay. Well... Let's get to the best of the best now, The Children of Men, which I pushed so hard for this movie because it's honestly one of my favorite movies. I love Children of Men. Love it. It's yeah. a 10 out of 10, for sure. It's beautiful. So, if you say it's lower than a 10 um, out of 10, you're wrong. Just, it okay. is. All right, good. But I have, I have an interesting take on this because I thought – the message and the execution and the delivery and the cinematography, everything was perfect. It was so good. But I don't really know or understand why I didn't connect really with this. And the only thing I can think of, usually I can, like, since I have studied film for so long, I can say, like, this is why I didn't Mm -hmm. like it. You know, like, here's the reasons why I didn't like it. Here's the reasons why I like it. There isn't much mystery of, like, you know, the bullshit film review, like, oh, I just didn't like it, or I just didn't get it. Like, that's that's dumb. That's a dumb reason. Um, but it, I'm going to stoop to that dumb level with this one because, like, I'm, I, I don't know why. The only thing I can think of is, like, I don't want kids. I don't care about kids. Babies freak okay, me out. But like, like, you want other people to have kids. Yeah, <laughs> like, very I, and I want humanity to continue <laughs> yes. being humanity. Like, I didn't look at this from a cynical uh, viewpoint, but like for whatever reason, like I don't know, it, I understand the weight of it. Well, yeah, because like but, society. Okay, so imagine if there, if the last person is born today, right? Mm-hmm. And then when we're sixty, 
Who's going to be the, who are the doctors to take care of us? Yeah. No, I mean, I I get it. Like you don't have to argue with me that humanity is important (laughs) and we should continue having children. Like that's level of stupid. (laughs) No, we're not like, but like, I don't know. It, it plus like, I mean, if you have a child, which the main character had, I forget his name, Clive Owens, his character, he had a child and he lost that child. And that's a different yeah, level of grief. Yeah, and that's the thing. Like, I don't understand that grief. I've never reached that level of well, grief that where like, it completely changes me as a person. Does helps you empathize uh, yeah, it should. with other people. It should. Perhaps. And and that's <laughs> I think that's where I'm having trouble connecting with this one because I didn't yeah. really connect with well, it Well, I don't know much. if that was really something that was, like, the main point of connecting. I think this movie was, like, hyper, like, focused on not just the characters but, like, broader humanity and huge yeah. this is a very political movie as well right yeah and i think that's what i really yeah. enjoyed about it and maybe it's going back to like what i was saying earlier about like the contagion my issue with contagion is i didn't connect with a character but did you connect in, with in an like order... the message kind of hmm. interesting i mean i connected with the overall message of like as humans we need to stop fighting over bullshit because we're just destroying the world and we're not getting anywhere and like there is beauty left in humanity if you let it happen and don't use that beauty to for to to further forward your message and your political agenda and ideals like respect the beauty and the humanity for what it is and it will thrive like that's the message and i got that like i get it and i understand (laughs) it and i enjoy it and i like it but like i don't know i i think if it was a character that i uh, that i liked more and that i cared about like I don't know. Maybe I would have enjoyed it more. That's the only thing I can think of. But even that doesn't make that much sense. Like, I can't sit here and argue with you about it. Mm. Like, I can argue 10 Chlorophyll <laughs> Lane with you and why you're wrong. But I can't argue with Children of Men. Like, I feel like I'm wrong for not getting it. Well, you know? maybe it's it's definitely a movie that is super rewatchable. I mean, this I've watched it a couple of times. And every time, I, I love it more. So maybe you just need to keep watching yeah. it. Yeah, I think I'd like it more if I watch it again. Like, knowing... The political story. And I think arc, it's just I'd probably the most like it realistic of all of the movies that we've watched. I feel like it, this is something that could actually happen. Yeah. Right? And I feel like. I don't know. I mean, uh, the whole like infertile thing is interesting mm-hmm. because that feels far fetched. I mean, I like don't know the, much like about the that actual side of collapse things. of like our society, but not like the complete collapse. Yeah. That's what's so interesting. You know, like people uh-huh. still go to work. Uh-huh. People have jobs. People have family. Well, yeah. They like know people. They don't have kids, but like their lives. Yeah. And the whole like everyone grieving over the famous celebrity child that was the youngest person. Like that was weird to me. Maybe. All that said to me was like humanity is still stuck on this bullshit idea of celebrity fandom, like getting murdered over not giving I an mean... autograph. Like, fuck off. Who gives a shit about Justin Bieber? I think baby Diego was kind of like humanity's hope for their future. And they lost that. How? How was it hope? When did baby Diego die? How old was he? Um, Like 13 or something? So he really young. Yeah. Or was he like a teenager? He was like 16 like, or I'm, something like that. I'm wondering if the reason they, uh, he was like, why was he hope for humanity? Unless like he was thought of as like possibly someone that could uh be fertile and bear a baby but since since they they made like women were the reason that you know babies couldn't be born like why would anyone care about the youngest dude they should care about the youngest woman because she might be fertile but then also fun fact the book uh in the book it's men sperm men can't produce Mm -hmm. sperm anymore so it's men's fault uh that uh, babies can't be born anymore so for whatever reason they changed that for the movie but it would almost make more sense if men were the reason and the baby diego like maybe his sperm was fertile but if he was like 16 i think he was time, just a symbol then they probably would i don't done think Tesla people actually were upset that that particular human life was no longer alive i think it was that they every person in the planet knew who this person was and he they were, had mm-hmm. put like their entire hope for having some kind of regular life again right I don't know. It's hard to like, I guess it's hard for you to, un- I don't want to say it's hard for you to understand. That sounds condescending. Um, it's hard 
You, it's you hard to wrap your it's, it's, it's hard That's to wrap why. your brain around it because it's nothing we've experienced. But I'm sure if yeah. we hadn't had a baby born in 18 years in the entire world, and then that our youngest person dies, we would be upset. Especially because there was a pretty large age gap between baby Diego and that other person who they said was the youngest. Now, it was It was a few more. years. I don't remember no. what it was, but it wasn't that much well, more. I mean, those yeah, are important, I don't know. important when you don't have youth i think it, the whole like and it's yeah, the whole like, like the loss whole, like, of youth which is like a really really big theme in all of human like human history like that's why people were so devastated during world war one and world war two we lost an entire generation of men each time yeah. right and like even if you didn't like know someone who died you still felt that loss as a like as a whole mm-hmm. like we we love youth they're like the future you know but like everyone like i mean don't get me wrong <laughs> death is death sad. is sad death is death is sad Jesus. and i understand like why diego was a celebrity in this i don't even this, think celebrity is the right future. term i think he was more like it, it felt like I, he was though like it felt like he was a celebrity no, I think like it's something he died more because he that. someone murdered him because he wouldn't give him an autograph like that's straight up some justin bieber he was, shit. He like was that's more all like it is an, like an idol like even higher than celebrity status like but they don't say anything about his character, like anything good he was doing. He just existed <laughs> as a person, and they were yeah, like, "Oh, he's he famous plot, because he's the youngest he was a one." Plot point, but like, plot piece. Uh, you weren't supposed. To- and everyone being so upset, they're crying at work and shit. Like, I understand like crying over a terrorist attack and shit, and like a bunch of people die or there's war. But like, this is war. This I, is I mean, don't get me there's- wrong. One person being murdered isn't worth everyone crying at work over. Well, when you already live in a society that's completely on the verge of falling apart, and that's a then, good like point. this one sliver of like maybe silver lining one day could push you, and over then the all edge. of a sudden it's yeah. just killed in a random act of violence. When you yeah, live in such a, a turmoil state already, you're gonna be upset. That's a good point. Yeah, I dig it. God, Kyle, watch the movie again. <laughs> so, what did you like? I I would what watch did you it like again. About this I did. Movie? No, I did. I really, I really did enjoy it, and I think it was flawlessly executed. It's such a beautiful um, movie. Like the car scene. So, yeah. Oh man. Yeah. So, oh, let me. I'm gonna. I'm gonna look this up. It's crazy because, because that is like not a false continuous take. So here's what they have written about the the car scene <laughs> so the long shot when the fiat was attacked by terrorists with all the yeah. passengers inside demanded a camera rig that could rotate within uh-huh. the car they used a rig developed by doggy cam systems and controlled by a stunt driver a vehicle was modified to enable seats to tilt and lower actors out of the way of the camera and the windshield was designed to tilt out of the way to allow camera movement in and out through the mm-hmm. windshield the single shot was shot in six takes over four locations, requiring a lot of transition mm-hmm. work from the visual effects house and double negative as it pans around inside the car. The cocktail, stunt driver, and motorcycle from the moment it hits the car, windshield, blood, and roof were all computer rendered with 3D animation. It's, it's That's fucking awesome. bonkers. Like the amount of effort Which, they put into this shot. The budget for Children of Men, which was 2006, was 76 million dollars. Yeah, well spent. So money. it's clear they spent. Yeah, well spent money. Well, opening weekend made half a million dollars. I mean, that makes sense. That's that's terrible. 28 days later, made 10. Yeah, that's half a million well, dollars. Why the hell did people not come see this movie? I don't know if people were upset knew who was the who the director was i don't know if they knew anything about it it's a weird movie concept you know if I, I was like so it would come to gross worldwide at 70.6 million dollars so it didn't even make its budget back yeah, but it's a good movie so it's fine it is it's great but that's what i'm trying to mm-hmm. understand like even though i didn't click with it it's an incredible yeah. film and i don't think anyone could watch this and say that's a bad movie you know, like you enjoy whether or not you can put yourself in it and you care mm-hmm. about it. You, it's still a super enjoyable movie and it's super important. So I'm surprised that so many people, like no one, went to go see this. Was it a problem with marketing? And I tried to like kind of mm-hmm. research this a little bit. I didn't get super deep into it, but I couldn't find a reason why people just didn't go see this movie. Well, uh, like again, if I was like, hey, 
do you want to go watch a movie where nobody could have kids? Like, this it's not a very interesting thing. <laughs> but if you said, do you want to go watch a post-apocalyptic movie but it's about not even the like super, one baby left in the world gets born? But it's born not and like a super like... apocalyptic movie in that sense either, you know? Like, it's yeah. not a Mad I Max. I mean, when you, suggested, when you suggested Children of Men, I had heard of it, had no idea yeah. what it was. Immediately, I was like, oh, hell yeah, this looks like an yeah. awesome movie. It is an awesome when movie. When you suggested Love Actually, <laughs> I was like, Fuck and no. that was why her when podcast ended children of the men. first time. <laughs> <laughs> when you suggested action. Children of Men, I was like, I'm totally on board with this. This is going to well, be Well, I awesome. also just love the director, and I love the cinematographer for this movie, this duo. They are badass. Yeah. They produced. They they, they did Gravity, which is, an, I don't know if you've seen Gravity. Do you I like haven't. it, or do you also not connect with it? <laughs> interestingly enough yeah. <laughs> i didn't connect with it but i did, did you like see, it it was about the same as me did you but see roma revenant did, did no, you I see revenant seen did you not connect did with roma? revenant i i loved revenant oh. and i loved birdman birdman is not the same director but same same cinematographer yeah. though yeah i haven't seen roma you yet, probably so won't but, connect with yeah. it <laughs> But it's okay. <laughs> probably, I mean, probably it's a 50-50 chance right now. But either way, I'll enjoy it's it. It's a really you know? beautiful movie. It's not the same cinematographer because um, Alfonso. Oh, it's no, not. Alfonso Curion does his own cinematography while directing. And it's it's really interesting. It's gorgeous. It's black and white. Whoa. Oh, that's fun. It's love really that shit. Um, so I've, I, I love the people who created this movie. Uh, I love this movie i think it's just like a beautiful piece of art just watching it it's very stressful movie too i don't know if you felt the yeah no it definitely (laughs) is super is very that one like long shot at the end where i think it lasts for like six minutes of him like running through a war zone literally yeah that was so amazing to get that shot like Like, when the blood splatters like on the camera lens like really Mm -hmm. they captured that like the crew is here filming this like while this is happening that's, yeah, or, yeah. It, I, like, I don't know. Like, there are scenes in this movie too that felt really human. Like Michael Caine's character, like when his when Jasper the uh, dies, when you're like you, you're mm-hmm. not there watching it, but you're watching it from afar. Like I, that scene yeah. is really intense for me. I don't know mm-hmm. about you, or when Julianne Moore dies. Like <laughs> that is that was sad, right? Oh, maybe I don't know if you did feel sad. Because you don't connect, but I I really felt for Jasper yeah. dying because uh, I really actually liked yeah. him as a character, um, and he sort of created this glimmer of hope in an apocalyptic society where it's like nobody has a really positive yeah. outlook on things except for him. And his now. death was really um, like he was killed by the good guys. Yeah. Which yeah. sucked because he like considered like doing the sleeping thing yeah. or whatever, you know. Um, so yeah, that was that that hit struck a chord with me. Also, uh, the girl's like nanny when she gets pulled off mm-hmm. the bus. Um, that one really struck a chord with me as yeah. well. Which interesting thing about that scene that I didn't know until I looked it up mm-hmm. later. Um, so written above. The entrance to Nazi death camps was this German phrase that meant work shall set you free. Mm -hmm. When they pull up to that refugee camp and they're pulling her off the bus and all that stuff, a song is playing and the lyrics to the song is work shall set you free. It's really interesting because I did get a Mm -hmm. lot of death camp vibes from that. Especially at the end. Yeah. Yeah. And to get that feeling, even though I didn't even know what those lyrics meant, but for it to go that Mm -hmm. deep. And like that's incredible. It is. It's an incredibly deep movie because it has so many layers to it, right? Like the fact that humanity is about to be saved by this woman who is like literally nobody gives a fuck about, right? She's a refugee, which yeah. I mean, this is we're dealing with stuff like this now, right? Yeah. Like this, yeah. that's what hit so hard for this movie is that it's so realistic yeah. in its like political like sense. I don't know. I loved mm-hmm. it. I thought it was a great movie. And I think it's really yeah. I thought it was great too. And I I think like mm-hmm. it's interesting because there's there's a side of humanity that's like you know refugees shouldn't be discriminated against. Everyone should have a healthy life. And like uh, England has you know become 
the safe zone mm-hmm. you know even america fell to like shit and so england has become this sort of safe zone and then uh all the refugees like of course everyone wants to make it to the safe mm-hmm. zone and so you know you understand this sort of political drive well if we let everyone in mm-hmm. everything's going to go to shit really fast we can't do that but then you have people that are treating human beings like utter garbage yeah. and complete trash and then the sort of socioeconomic uh, side that comes with all of that leads to complete discrimination. Mm-hmm. And so which we, yeah. this film hit that really well, but also what this film does is it hits the opposite radical side really yeah. well too. Because you have organizations like Antifa, which at the heart, they want to fight back against this organization that is not doing mm-hmm. good, but at the same time, fighting back in such a violent manner clearly does no good for anyone. And what, what's and so, so so that's where this comes this, in, is it? And not yeah. many films do And what this that. movie does is it does turn, like I said, the good guys kind of become the bad guys, but they still, at the end, maintain, like, their humanity. Like, you, f- I felt, like, upset, you know, at the end. Like, I felt like, the, the, like yeah. when they all died, you know? It's interesting, yeah, and you feel upset for both yeah. sides, too, because when they pass through, I mean, that, that scene walking through the war zone mm-hmm. with a baby yeah. like that is one of and i realize it now one of the most iconic scenes in you know modern film like that's huge everyone talks about it um and so that's amazing and everyone's stopping and staring yeah. and the fighting ceases and then one of the radicals fires a shot back at the army they yeah. fire shots back again everything continues as soon as the baby passes through that's so incredibly powerful and it gives each side like you look at both of those sides at the end of that movie and you're like everyone is fighting and it's fucking pointless Mm -hmm. everyone's just killing each other and everyone's a human being but everyone's just fucking killing Mm -hmm. each other and this this is why the rest of the world has gone to shit and england's gonna go to shit now too and this baby is the only thing left in humanity and all you could do is stop for 10 seconds yeah like what are you doing what are you actually fighting for because it's right here in front of your fucking eyes yeah that's why this is a great movie it's a 10 it out of 10 it is a great movie. it sounds like you I, I sounds agree. like you're connecting with it just a little bit more just the more you well, talk that's about the it thing. the characters maybe not but the story I yes yeah. i connect with the story so super strongly um and they did a lot to to sort of make that idea of peace come through without giving it a super hippie vibe mm-hmm. which i thought i really appreciated that and it it tells this story and it gives this lesson, but it doesn't force it on right. you. It doesn't shove it down your throat. It's not telling you which side to pick. It's not saying what's right and what's mm-hmm. wrong. It's saying, here's a glimmer of hope. And the story of this tiny glimmer of hope drowning in a haystack, yeah. but it's still there. You know, it's there. When you're fighting with somebody else, it's yeah. there. There is this sense of humanity and future that's left. And all you have to do is notice it long enough. Mm-hmm to stop fucking killing each other like that's and i thought that was beautiful yeah i mean that's what happens in history like we don't it, it, when we have these big human crises like world war Two and like the holocaust it, we can't we can't really focus on all the individuals that are being affected by this right we kind of like take a step back when we're looking at these situations and thinking of it on a grand humanity scale right so maybe like that's yeah. the kind of vibe i got from this movie is that the individuals weren't super important you know, and then maybe yeah. that's what made it hard for you to connect with it. Yeah. So I'm I'm curious. I want to backtrack a little bit. Um, in in the novel being about men not producing yeah. sperm, and the film being about women being infertile, does that change affect anything? Was there did, to you being a woman? Was there any sort of did it seem like there was a blame? on either side of it or like is it like why change that i don't know but i mean it it's interesting because like what's what if we boil men and women down biologically like the biggest difference right we produce life you guys don't and it's like that part of Mm -hmm. like our like identity is suddenly no longer a thing i don't know how Mm -hmm. it changes it but it definitely does right yeah. I, don't, I don't I don't know beyond that. It's interesting. I didn't yeah. know that they I changed mean, either it. Way, it doesn't change. Yeah, it doesn't change the fact that the the 
the refugee yeah. girl, I forget I just, her name, yeah. has a I baby. Feel like, like that, that, I feel like you know, women takes two, will but. have more to lose in society if they can't reproduce. Like, just from, like, mm-hmm. social stigma. Like Yeah. No, yeah. I agree. Because, like, nobody asks yeah. guys why they don't have kids. But if you're 30 and you don't have kids yet, girls are going to get asked that all the time. You know? So, yeah. I don't know. I don't know why he did that change. That's interesting. We should yeah. call him. I'll ask know. him. <laughs> That'd be great. Schedule <laughs> okay, an interview. Fun, so That'd be fantastic. Please be on our podcast. Oh my Kyle god! Kyle hates all your movies, but or he doesn't. <laughs> that would I would be honest with him. If we got him on here, I would totally. I would. I. I wouldn't hide and be like, "Oh, I love all your shit." Like, and I do, but like, you know, yeah. it comes with a caveat. I mean, maybe you just don't get that him. That would be that would be super Fine. interesting. It's all good. Um. So in Children of Men, ev- almost every single shot contains an animal, which I didn't pick up really? on while I was watching, but that's a fun fact. And it said, usually it's a dog, oh. but almost every single shot has an animal in it, which, it, you know, and whether or not whoever wrote this fun fact trivia is taking liberties on what every <laughs> single shot is, it, it's probably, but it does mean the majority of a film, there are animals around it. I, I think that was probably an aesthetic choice given like this is hope of humanity Mm -hmm. you know like animals are hope you know we we like animals we enjoy animals and especially if if it's usually a dog that's like a companion you know like i i think that was a pretty cool aesthetic choice Hmm. um also theo never touches a gun the entire movie and uh i i kind of picked up on that but i also he never gets to smoke a whole cigarette because he, he lights up like a bunch of times he but he never gets to finish yeah. a cigarette and that i think that really propels the film i think well, that's, that's kind of his that's why what you're saying it's always tense yeah, yeah and it, it, but it's not like a choice where he's like i just smoke half cigarettes like it's like he likes to smoke and he wants to get an yeah. edge off because there's all this well, crazy like, shit going it, on but he never not gets to finish picking up a gun is just like really like symbolizes his character who like doesn't want mm-hmm. anything to do with any of this at all Mm -hmm. he doesn't want to be there he doesn't care but i mean at the end he obviously cares because he cares about this girl and her baby but he doesn't really seem to care about like the sides of the war or anything like that yeah and i totally get like the whole him losing his child that's important and you know normally like a, a lot of movies will try to do that and they'll like put something in like oh he lost his child he's grieving but like it's not really that important but in in this you know framework that is super important to his character why he's so distant why he's so cold but also why he suddenly cares about this one human being and why he wants to get back into things like you know so it it really really makes sense uh in in this film more than yeah because there is that one convert one of the only conversations that he has with his like ex-wife because she's not in it for very much but they talk about how Mm -hmm. he is so he was so upset with her because she wasn't grieving right yeah Yeah. which i i understand that feeling i mean it it's my brother understands me more now we're very very close but back when my grandfather Mm -hmm. died who was my favorite person on the fucking planet um and you know he didn't die suddenly or anything but when he did die like my my idea of grief was to just shut everything off. Yeah. Like let me be by myself and in and my head for a while. And that doesn't mean you're not grieving because like, like, like exactly. Juliet says, she's like, I think about him all the time. Right. Mm-hmm. She just doesn't necessarily yep. show it because that's how grief works for different people. Yeah. And my brother didn't understand that. Granted at the time he was like really, really yeah. little, but I, I remember like he was too young to be cursing <laughs> and he called me an asshole oh, in front wow. of my mom. <laughs> because i wasn't like right. crying or visibly sad yeah. when we left his and funeral. that's like that's and i think why they their marriage or their relationship whatever they had didn't last and that happens actually a lot in reality where losing a child leads to the end of the relationship it's a really really yeah. hard thing for people to move on with, with. and i think they did yeah. a really good job I can with, imagine. like showing that side of him and her yeah yeah so um, the last fun fact I have from this is what I'll go back to what I thought it was 20 days later, but it's actually Children of Men, where um, there's a lot of uh, imagery that was brought from like actual political and and terrorist events and like things like that. Um, I'm going to try to find it on here. There was one 
it was super interesting that I looked up afterwards because I didn't know what it was. There's a hooded man from Abu uh, Garib. I don't know how to pronounce <laughs> that, but it's from the Iraq uh-huh. War. And so there's this like torture. Uh, there's this famous photo of this person being tortured, and it's this person in this like weird like scarecrow looking robe and like almost like an executioner mask, and they're standing on this tiny little bucket, and they've got some stuff hooked up to them, and um, that's a famous photo from being tortured. And there's actually in the movie at the uh, refugee camp when they're showing people there's like an exact like they took that photo and built someone to look exactly like that standing on a thing uh in there i thought that was really and that's something that's powerful when you watch it and don't know what it is but after like looking at these historical events and seeing these facts like you see how far in depth they go to sort of uh put these real life terrible events into what is happening in this sort of dystopian future and how yeah, realistic and it's so it is so creepy because it like so predicts like the refugee crisis that would hit you know mm-hmm. and it, ugh, this, that's why this movie seems so realistic to me is because it's like some of the stuff that happens is literally happening in places like syria right like not yeah. the whole like being infertile thing but like complete war zone areas of where like no one would think london right could be like this yeah that's Mm -hmm. a wild thought but who knows maybe it could we don't know yeah absolutely wild well um yeah and especially after talking about it this in depth like i the more i talk about it the more i like there's just so much to talk about it's such a great movie there is and it's it's so flawless i can't believe it didn't make that much money like that's bizarre to me because it's so well done oscar for uh cinematography did it get yeah, nominated? Yeah, it did. Didn't win. What I beat don't it? Know. Uh, know? Would require research, <laughs> which we don't do. <laughs> yeah, I'm curious. At least it was nominated yeah. though. Like it's good. It, it got and the recognition the it deserved. Well, is the only cinematographer to win three Oscars back to back for Gravity, Emmanuel, Gravity, Lubezki. Birdman, Revenant, which are all absolutely gorgeous movies. So, yes. if you yes. like this movie, you should watch all of those. Unless you're you, Kyle. I don't know. I don't know about you anymore. <laughs> what? You won't you might not get them. <laughs> Shut the fuck <laughs> up. So if uh, you like those movies also, continue to tune into film strippers. I, I we're definitely not going to come back with uh bi weekly. No. Were we releasing we weekly? Were, it was week at first it was bi weekly, but that was crazy. And then we went weekly and then that was also crazy. Bi-weekly is twice a week? I thought bi-weekly is every other week, right? Oh, right. So we were, we, were, we, we were semi-weekly at first, then it doesn't matter. We had episodes that we put out way too often. But were we releasing every, yeah, yeah. every week? Like, that's a that's lot a of lot. work. Looking back on it now, like, there's a good reason why we stopped doing film strippers, and it was a lot, <laughs> a lot of, work, of work. Yeah, and I really like yeah, this format so, more of us just talking about more of, like, a broad subject and then throwing some films in there. Yeah, it like it's it's tough because I don't want to like if you haven't seen one of the four, like I don't want to prevent yeah. you from listening to the episode. But at the same time, like it, it does feel better. Um, it feels cooler to like pack two hours of content into one episode, and then like maybe a month down the line we'll do another episode or yeah. something. Um, it's kind of like the A twenty four podcast. It's like but, we could I just mean, you know we obviously don't hold a candle to them. Like fucking A twenty four. Whatever we want. Gods. Whatever we want. We don't have a yeah, schedule. I mean, we don't uh, have to need any of that. <laughs> exactly. It makes it feel a lot yeah. better and a lot more manageable. It's like this one, we planned on recording last week. <laughs> but weekend, we didn't. But we like, it's, ah, fine. it's fine. <laughs> Just take your time. Like, watch the movies when yeah. you watch them, and we'll make an episode. It's the same thing for James Bond. Like, you know, we're going to watch yeah. all the movies. And although that one, we got to record right after No Time to Die <sighs> but comes out. We just out, said so we don't have a schedule. Watching. So. Yeah, well, you got till fucking November. Fine. You got okay. time. I guess I literally have nothing um, else to do. <laughs> yeah, but I, I don't know. I'd like to um, see where this goes. And, I mean, we have our interview yeah. episodes, David Mickey Evans, Andrew Wade, mm-hmm. um, 
Craig Patrick, a producer of Apocalypse. That was an awesome episode. Like those are my yeah. favorite episodes when we got to interview these people that were making these these mm-hmm. awesome films. So I think it'd be cool to keep it going where we discuss specific yep. films and I don't know, maybe we'll branch off and and start just interviewing filmmakers too on the side and, and it's doing basically some we're just gonna do cool. whatever we feel like when we feel like doing we'll do it. Whatever the fuck <laughs> we want. I'm tired of like giving these viewers false yeah. expectations that I give on myself where I'm like I have to entertain my viewers you know like no if you want to listen to the podcast listen to the podcast that's totally cool and we thank you so much for listening give us a five-star rating (laughs) but you know like it's I just want to have fun with it that's what we're here we're not here to make money we don't have any sponsors we're not going to tell you to go to Squarespace or any of that bullshit like if someone was like hey dudes and dudettes we'll give you you know a $30,000 $30,000 a year to keep this going every week. Yeah, yeah I'd do, we'll that. do that in a but second. Like, <laughs> if you want to yeah, do that, just let like, us know. Yeah. Yeah, if you want to sponsor film strippers, I'm not going to say no to your money. <laughs> but I'm not going out searching for a sponsor. Like, I just want to do this for fun. I want people to enjoy film. I want other people that already do enjoy film to listen to this and be like, Kyle sucks. He's such an idiot and he's wrong about everything. Like, that's awesome. Like, <laughs> just connect with us on some yeah. level. Use film as the medium. There's a hundred other film podcasts out there. We appreciate you listening to ours. Uh, I don't know. It's it's something that brings us to be- together as human beings and and is beautiful doing something like this through a pandemic and and a lockdown watch more movies review more movies i'll recommend letterboxd obviously this isn't a solicit a paid solicitation whatever (laughs) like uh a letterbox is an amazing mm-hmm. app you can review movies there's tons of people in there there's a social media aspect it's a beautifully made uh it's made for like film people and i've moved from getting all my reviews and ratings i originally did it with imdb but then that was flooded with people that don't know what the fuck they're talking about so i moved to rotten tomatoes which is still a, a, it's a really good like idea of if it's fresh from a critic rating i'm probably gonna enjoy watching yeah. it even if i don't agree with it and then if it's fresh on both critic and audience it'll be a great movie you know sometimes um, but then letter- trolls out there. Yeah. sometimes <laughs> Yeah, but then Letterbox is an entirely social media base, but I think the crowd with Letterbox is people that want to review yeah. movies. And so it it's a really good rating. You could follow certain people. It's a really good rating system there where uh, I get a generally good idea of whether or not I'm going to enjoy a movie just from looking at Letterbox mm-hmm. ratings now. Yeah. I, I mean, I have downloaded it. I haven't put much um, work into it, but I'm excited to try it out. Oh, yeah, I forgot you're not actually uh, keeping up with it. It's also great for nerds like me. I love my numbers and statistics. Like, I love Mm -hmm. that so much. And Letterboxd has an awesome system where they're like, you can look back at your diary and be like, oh, I watched 30 movies this (laughs) month. Like, I think I I watched 30 in January, like 32 in February, and then like 10 in March because I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Well, that's those are some fun fun facts about Kyle. <laughs> I love looking at that shit. And then it's like, here's your average rating. Here's uh, all this. Yeah, fun facts about me. I'm sorry. <laughs> movies excite me. Exciting. That's, that's why I'm taking my time do to this. do this. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, keep an eye out for more film strippers because we we're releasing this, but I want to yeah. do more. Um, and contact us on uh, our social media platforms. We have Facebook and we have Instagram or filmstrippers at gmail.com. Uh, if you want to talk to us, you know, send us a, an email or message. If you're another filmmaker yourself, maybe we'll even interview you for a part of an episode or something. Just uh, let us know. Yeah. And if you want to sponsor us. <laughs> and if you want to give we us We will money. always take anyone's money. <laughs> but mostly your ratings and your yes, smiles. Those are more important. <laughs> well thanks for listening uh we will see you on the next episode as of last night there were five deaths and 32 cases there's a cluster in an elementary school okay that's the kind of thing you're going to have to be prepared for it's going to be all over the news big time what's your single overriding communications objective we're isolating the sick and quarantining those who we believe were exposed okay good 